Hello from Frederick Community College Mid-Atlantic Center for Emergency Management and Public Safety. I'm Kathy Francis, Executive Director, and I represent a talented group of individuals providing academic training and professional services nationwide. Join me to welcome Amy Lepore, President of Anthem Planning Incorporated, as our outstanding partner on the Collaborative Public Safety Technology Interview Series. Welcome, Amy. Kathy, thank you for having us again this week. We're having a wonderful time conducting these interviews. We've really enjoyed this partnership and meeting a growing network of folks who are really interested in public safety technology. Um, but I'm super excited for our guest today um, because we've not yet had the chance to talk in depth about uh, ways that organizations partner to improve upon technology. So Cheryl, our guest, has had great experiences working with jurisdictions to problem solve around interoperability partnerships and governance. So we're thrilled to have her with us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And, and thank you. And Cheryl, it is our pleasure to welcome you. Uh, Cheryl Jiggins is the founder of CTA Consultants. Uh, she brings 35 years of management experience and over 30 years of experience in wireless telecommunications and E911 services for local, state, and federal uh, governments. Uh, Cheryl serves as the principal consultant on projects of many sizes. Uh, they range from a single county or a single city system to multi-jurisdictional, uh, regional, and statewide systems across the United States. So Cheryl, um, welcome to our interview series. Would you like to tell us a little more about CTA and its services? Certainly. Thank you so much. I really um, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys today. Um, CTA has been around for a while in many different forms, but we've recently reconfigured ourselves um, as a smaller entity. And what we really are trying to do is not only help the public safety community, but also give back to the public safety community. 100% um, of our net profits over the life of our company go to public safety training as well as STEM education. We think that that's so important because, you know, those kids that are so bright and so smart, they're the ones that are going to come up with the great next innovative technology that's going to help our people in public safety. So that's really our passion. Um, and like you said, we work on projects that are small, um, medium and large, but we really do enjoy working at the county level mostly because that really gives us an opportunity to get to know our clients and, um, you know, be, be very personable with them and really help them meet their needs. And as we'll talk about today, also help them think about ways that they can partner with those around them to not only improve interoperability, but also help them save some money. Wonderful. Thank you. Cheryl, you have worked closely with the organizations in Central Virginia, um, and it is a good starting point for our conversation and an excellent case study um, in the early adoption of interoperability practices. Can you give us an overview of your work there so far? Sure. You know, it's kind of interesting. That was a project that really started when I did in this business um, in the early 90s. And, um, you know, it was, it was several small localities that were starting to form, you know, at, back then they were starting to form local government councils. And you now see that pretty prolific throughout certainly the East Coast area. It allows multiple jurisdictions to work together and to really join together and develop cooperative agreements so that they can have better purchasing power. So this is something that we did back in the 90s and a number of localities, the city of Lynchburg, Amherst County, Bedford County and the city of Bedford, which is now a town of Bedford, also Campbell County and oftentimes Appomattox County worked together on many, many projects. And so each of them were finding they needed a new radio system and you know, public safety communications radio systems cost millions of dollars, even at a small jurisdiction level. You, know, you have to put out expensive towers, you have to buy expensive radios, you not only have to have one that you carry around, you have to have one in your vehicle. So all of that really adds up and, and costs a lot of money for an individual locality. And so they were thinking, how in the world do we finance this? But then they also started thinking, you know, we work together a lot. There's a, we still have a lot of volunteer fire, a lot of volunteer EMS here in our region, and they're constantly helping each other. So that means if one agency puts in a radio system and, and then another agency or another jurisdiction and they don't communicate with each other, how are we gonna to continue to work together? So that was something that was really in the forefront of their minds because back in the 90s, most of our systems were proprietary in nature and they did not always communicate and interoperate well together. So they thought, well, what if we build one big system and then all of us could use it? Which is a great idea, right? 
It's great for interoperability. And by the way, interoperability wasn't a big word back in the 90s. It certainly is now because people understand the critical need for it. So we always like to think that we were on the cutting edge of, of that um, train of thought. So they thought, okay, how do we do this financially? How do we do this operationally? So um, CTA came in and worked with them and did a needs assessment with all the counties and really developed a plan whereby they could have one large system, but yet they could operate it autonomously. So it was multiple subsystems. So in day-to-day -day operations, each locality felt like they had their own radio system, yet it was part of a larger network. And it certainly gave them things like, you know, purchasing power. They were able to buy things at a lower cost because they were buying more of it. Um, it gave them that mutual aid, that interoperability that they critically need day in and day out. But it also gave them, you know, the opportunity to kind of be forward thinking in how they went about not only doing what they did operationally, but figuring out how to finance it. And simple things like the city of Lynchburg had technical expertise that they could bring to this, you know, cooperative um, environment. Um, Amherst had a great uh, financial standing, so they were able to do the bonding. And the, each entity really was just able to bring something that was important to the table and that benefited the group. So they did create a cooperative purchasing agreement. And then what they did was they created what was called a committee, that's the Central Virginia Regional Communications Board. And so that really gave everybody a seat at the table and it allows them to determine what they do operationally, as well as what they do for maintenance long-term on their system. And it's really been a relationship that has worked well for them, You know, like I said, since the early 90s. So it's going on multiple decades now. Well, thank you, Cheryl. I thank you for sharing that case study in, in Central Virginia. Um, so I'm sure there's still a strong focus in, in other small rural jurisdictions across the United States that couldn't afford this new technology. Um, talk to us a little bit more about how interoperability and these uh, sharing arrangements have kept the cost down, where this model could be replicated um, somewhere else across the United States. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the interesting thing is back back in the 90s at the time, you know, it still did cost um, a, quite a bit of money for each locality to buy into the system. And our local Campbell County was not financially able to do that. And just re very recently, as a matter of a couple of months ago, their board has decided to join this system. So when you design these systems that are meant to hold multiple localities, you need to be forward thinking and think about others that may need to join. So they configured it such that Campbell can join their systems. And we're replicating that over um, in Harrisonburg. Harrisonburg County, um, here at the city of Harrisonburg and Rockingham County have a joint system. And Page County is now looking to join that system. So we've just helped them through the process um, of writing an RFP and making sure they get the coverage they need. But we will replicate um, the cooperative purchasing agreement that they've done here in Central Virginia, hopefully over there to help them work together and really build upon that system. And what that does is that allows Page County not to have to purchase large pieces of what we call the brains of a system. Um, and they can be able to use what Harrisonburg has because it's certainly so large that they would never use all the capacity but also the sites, you know, where the sites are in Harrisonburg provides really good coverage into Page County so they can benefit from that coverage, which again is what Campbell County here locally is seeing. You know, the sites that you have in Lynchburg and Bedford, you know, really the thing about RF waves, they don't stop at a jurisdiction border, right? It really, you know, goes over and they're gonna be able to realize a lot of that good coverage and not have to build as many sites. So we're really seeing that more and more you will see that um, uh, a little bit north of us in Hanover County, they've chosen to do the same thing. They're partnering with Fakir and Culpepper. So a lot of um, jurisdictions are seeing if we work together, we can save a lot of money, but it's not just the money. We can also have that seamless interoperability. So when something happens at our border, and you know, we have multiple people coming to that scene from, from different jurisdictions. We can all talk to each other. You know, we don't have to have somebody standing out in the middle of the street, you know, relaying information, which sounds humorous, but really that ins there was an incident here in Bedford County where that happened. Um, a tanker went over a bridge you know, between Lynchburg and Bedford and caused a large fire. They weren't sure what the chemical was, at least the city side wasn't, the county knew. And, you know, that depends upon how do you put that fire out, right? Do you use foam? Do you use water? And they literally could not talk to each other. They could see each other across the bridge, but could not communicate. So they had to have somebody running through the ravine 
to you know to share information from one locality to the other. So having these systems where they can seamlessly interoperate with really really saves lives. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And I have a follow-up question for you. You've made me really think about these um, large jurisdictions and how complex this interoperability project would be. Would you help our audience understand the types of positions and the types of people that you work with when you do go into a you know, municipality or a county to help with a system of this nature? Certainly. When we go in, what we want to do is make sure that we have the voices heard of everyone who's going to use the system. So typically it would be your local law enforcement, whether it's sheriff or your city police. We want to talk with fire. We want to make sure the local EMS is heard. But also we're finding these systems, again, have the capacity to bring on others like public works, um, you know, animal control, just about anybody who might need that, that type of communication. We've even seen localities partner with utilities. Um, that, that's another great way to bring users onto a system to help fund it. But you really need to talk with every user. And then you also need to make sure you talk with the financial people, right? You've got to make sure you understand exactly what their financing capabilities are and how you can be creative in pulling all of that together. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for helping us understand that public safety and communications and technology really span uh, multiple positions uh, within a jurisdiction. Thank you. Cheryl, when we were initially discussing the case study, um, I found it remarkable um, that it has been um, first in place, uh, the arrangements for so many years. So it is time tested, it has spanned elections and political change. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the mechanisms in place that permit the long lasting relationships? What are some of the things you see and these organizations that permit this type of partnership? Well, that's a great question. I think what's been so successful for Central Virginia, certainly, has been the fact that they did create this committee, which they call the Central Virginia um, Communica Radio Communications Board. And these are the people, really, that run the communication system. So they're the boots on the ground, right? They're the people that use the system day in and day out. And they've really worked together to put forth a system that works really well. And obviously, when something works well, then the politicians tend to stay out of it, right? <laughs> so that, that's, that's one thing that they have in their favor, that they've, they've put together a good system. But also, we have found that just recently, um, in 2012, they had to replace the system. So that's always a piece where it gets a little bit um, tenuous, right? Now you're asking these political bodies for millions of dollars to, to put in a new system. So how do you do that? What they did was they actually went in and revised their cooperative agreement just a little bit to really make it more current. Because if you think about it, it was written back in the 90s, right? That's a little bit old. So they went back and did some revisions, but they found that most of what they had in place was working very successfully, mainly because the people on the board met together frequently, they work together, they interoperate with each other. And so they have that good working relationship. And so when you have that relationship, and then you also have the chief administrative person, whether it's the city mayor or a town you know, elected official, who, who is signing off on it, they really trust the people in the public safety that are on the ground to make good decisions and do what's right. So in 2012, when they had to bond more money, they redid the agreement, giving our local planning district commission the opportunity to bond and be able to finance this. And so we're finding that it's gonna continue very, very similarly to it, how it has since the early nineties, you know, just with a few tweaks to keep things a little bit more modern when it comes to financing. Cheryl, are you okay with a quick follow-up question? Sure. So I'm curious, um, for a jurisdiction wants to reach out to its partner organizations and seek out some type of sharing arrangement, what are the first steps you think a jurisdiction can take? Well, I think the first steps you do is you go talk to the people that you interoperate with, you know, day in and day out. So those are those mutual aid partners. So it, it, you, know, it, you see a lot of mutual aid, certainly in the fire and EMS, not as much in law enforcement because they're really required to work within their jurisdiction boundaries. But fire and EMS work together all the time. So you really start there. You have the fire chief in one locality, you talk to the fire chief in the next locality. And start to, to think about, you know, how often do we work together? Is it, you know, is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Is it every six months? And that really kind of helps you judge whether or not some sort of um, joint system will really be in the, not only the financial best interest, but the operational best interest. If it's not a locality that you do a lot with, it probably doesn't make sense. 
But if it's someone that you interoperate with a lot, it, it likely will make sense. And then you'll find that as you get to get beyond the people who work together frequently and then you move more towards the law enforcement, you know, naturally they think, well, no, I just operate in my jurisdictional boundaries. That's, that's all the law allows me to do. But then you help them think outside the box. Well, so what happens? My experience has been that bad guy, if you're chasing him, doesn't stop at your border, does he? <laughs> they keep going. And generally you keep going, right? And you need to be able to talk with that law enforcement in the next locality to either continue to support in their locality or just hand off, you know, the chase, whatever's going on. But then you'll also find out that, you know, bad things happen right at our borders and you will have multiple law enforcement, you know, people on the scene, whether it's multiple jurisdictions or whether it's your jurisdiction and state, you know, you have state agencies that will come in during emergencies. And so all of these things, if you help them to think about who do you need to talk with and how difficult is it, it's kind of hard sometimes to get go back to your dispatch, have them get on a phone, call the next agency, and then have that agency try to dispatch out. It's almost like back, back at that scene I told you about where you have somebody running across the ravine, right? <laughs> I mean, you're doing it through telephones, but still you've got multiple relays of people. And really that can put lives in danger when they're on a critical scene and they need to be talking in real time. Those conversations are important. Cheryl, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Uh, Amy and Anthem Planning, we value our continued partnership. Uh, shout out to our Mason and Public Safety team who takes this great idea and just makes it all happen. So it's truly been our pleasure to expand uh, the network of our audience and connect with the best and the brightest minds in the field uh, to help them break down fast-moving technologies, keep tabs on industry trends, and to enhance their knowledge and their agency's ability to respond. So we hope you'll continue to join us every Monday for your briefing, your tips and tricks from our experts to help you make implementing technology that much easier. Thank you.